Dr. Jerry, you got the whole world waiting. Been ready for you to start the conversation. No point of view, it got the haters confused. Leave it up to you to bring us all the good news. Positive vibes and the sex appeal to Dr. Andre Jerry. Can I get an interview? You, 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 you. Hello, everybody. Good evening, and thanks for tuning in to a special episode of Live with Dr. Andre Jerry. This, of course, is Black History Month, which celebrates black history makers and key figures in American culture. Now, Black History Month is not just intended to honor historical black figures who have long passed. It's also an opportunity to celebrate our current black figures who are making their mark in history. I want to send a shout out to Governor Wes Moore, who was duly elected last year as the first black governor of the state of Maryland, only the third black person elected as governor of any state. And as of 2023, the only incumbent black governor in the nation. Now that's quite an achievement worthy of celebrating. And likewise, there are many black Americans who are making history right in our own communities and families. Many of us are our family's first politician, doctor, nurse, lawyer, or the first one to earn a degree, write a book, or own a business or nonprofit. There are a myriad of ways in which we could be contributing to black history just in our own families. So let's all encourage one another and also acknowledge and celebrate our relatives who are doing great and positive things and making a great impact on the world. Now, in line with the theme of celebrating black history and black excellence, tonight's show features notable black authors who are leaving their mark on history. My first guest is a friend to the show who I've had the pleasure of interviewing a few months ago. Dr. Stephen Bond is the grandson of David G. Bond, one of the many hidden figures in black American history that are often overlooked. David G. Bond was a North Carolina native and brilliant innovator who designed, built, and patented the very first automobile turn signal back in 1927 when he was just 16 years old. It was later patented when he was 20 years old. However, due to Jim Crow era discrimination in the South, he was unable to secure credit or loans to renew his patent, which resulted in the loss to his claim to the invention of the turn signal. Now, last year, I was blessed with the opportunity to interview his grandson, Dr. Stephen Bond, on the show. And during that episode, we spoke at length about his grandfather, his invention, and some of the unfortunate challenges and racial prejudices he endured during that time. Dr. Bond's latest book honors his grandfather's legacy and shares the story behind his groundbreaking invention. I'm super excited to have him as a guest on tonight's show to share with us the progress he's made uh, in sharing his grandfather's story with the masses. So, Dr. Bond, welcome back to the show, brother. How have you been lately? Thank you, Dr. Jerry. I am doing awesome. I'm doing great. It is so great to be on your show again. Uh, all is well. Um, I've gotten so much feedback from the book and just it, a day does not go by where someone texts me or email me or DM me about how much they enjoy the book and how it inspired them to see if any of their families did something significant that went unknown and unsung. So just a response and feedback had just been wonderful, and I'm so appreciative of it as well. Oh, well, I'm listen, I'm glad to have you on the show. I was so happy to hear about all the progress that's been made uh, since you were on the show last November. I've been following you, of course, and uh, I said, you know, i got to have this guy on to let us know what progress he's been making. You know, it seems like a lot has happened in terms of exposure just over, you know, the past few months. So uh, take a little bit of time and share with our listeners what has transpired since you were last on the show. Well, since I last on the show, um, I've had several educators buy the book and buy bundles of the book because they wanted their school to know the whole story. I have a friend of mine who's a principal in uh, East New York, Brooklyn, good friend of mine, and he brought up over 100 books just so his school had copies. Wow. But, wow. Yes. And uh, my own superintendent at my school got a copy. I was teaching one day. She came up to me and said, Doc, you need to talk to me for a second. And I was like, everything okay? She's like, yes, your book is awesome. I need you to sign my book for me. So it's, just, so it's been a wonderful thing. And so 
the word's been getting out and the people I know just, not just in my home state who've been buying it and are happy that the legacy is being told because many in the county where my grandfather and grandfather lived knew the story and they knew about it, but not much was done. And also yeah. the mayor of um, Windsor, North Carolina, where my grandfather was born and my father was born, he was interested in the book and he didn't know the story and he was the mayor of this town. And so he called me, asked if he meet. And he was digging around, asking other folk about it. Before he met me, he said, do you know about this invention of Dave George Bond? And one of his friends was like, yeah, everybody knows about it. And by the way, I'm related to Stephen Bond. So we, he was so <laughs> delighted about it. And uh, we actually took a picture in front of the town hall with the book. So it's really been making a lot of headway. And like I said, I'm just so appreciative of it. And not just in North Carolina, people from many states that brought it uh Friends of mine who teach in California uh, have brought the book. Uh, people in Illinois brought the book and Texas and various states where they're buying the book and just telling others a story about just unsung hero adventures. So it's cool to see the word spreading around about it. Yes, that's awesome. And that's one of the uh, things I love about partnering with Amazon and KDP is that you can get your book sold all over the country as well as in, in many other countries around the world. So uh, having them to kind of take the lead on that distribution end really kind of alleviates a lot of the pressure, for, especially for new authors. You know, when you write your first book, even your first couple of books, it can be very overwhelming. And you're like, okay, well, how am I going to get my book to someone if they buy it and, you know, if they want to buy it and they live in Canada or something like that. But when you partner with KDP and Amazon, I guess I'm giving them a little <laughs> free promotion here, but it really does take the edge off and, all you have to do is upload your stuff there. Um, they take care of all the order fulfillments and send everything out. So it takes a lot of pressure off of new uh, authors. But um, just listening to you, it sounds like 2023 has been an extremely busy year. I mean, you've met the mayor. You've been on a few other shows. You've sold, what, over 100 copies of your book for educational purposes, Um I saw recently where you were featured on the local news in Birdie County. How, can you explain how that came about? Yes. Well, um, a couple of journalists in the area had heard the story about um, my grandfather and meeting with the mayor. So on a WNCT News in Greenville, North Carolina, they had heard the story. And um, the journalist's name is Abigail Velez, awesome journalist, just like pretty much out of college. She called me and said she'd like to do a story on it. And so just this past Sunday, she did the story on it. And she's an amazing job. And so she covered the fact of my grandfather and how he invented it. And I showed her the book and she had a copy of the book. And I also mentioned about the patent. And she showed how you know, the patent was his. And one of the things that she was added on and the news added on, which I really like, there's been controversy about First, did we have the pattern for it, which he did. And then someone said, well, this other guy had a patent for it who gets a credit. And um, someone at Google search and said, won't say the person's name because his family might be offended. But they said he was the one that had the first patent for it. But if you look at research, he received a patent for it in 1929, where my grandfather got the patent issued by the U.S. government two years before, on March 1st, 1927, and it patent was legally done, and it's in the book. So that was two years before, and so that took away any disagreement, and what I liked was the fact when the news station, not only did they put it on the news um, that night, but they also put it on a website in the story that this guy who they give credit to, his patent was two years after my mm -hmm. grandfather. So I'll let you know that he was... Um, going to just treat it, especially since he did two years before. So a lot of people have watched the story and has like a thousand views already on YouTube and different social media outlets. And so the word's getting around even more. And I had um, a person just, two people called me just today and said they want to do a story about it. And so I told them definitely. So my phone was, after the story was done on the news on TV, my phone literally been ringing off the hook nonstop. So it's been a blessing. I'm just glad for it. 
Yes, oh, man, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. I mean, it's a very compelling story. And with this being Black History Month, I'm sure there's a lot of renewed interest in your book. And, you know, I, I mentioned this last time that we uh, were on the show, or that you were on the show as a guest. I see this being a movie. I, 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 I'm just putting that out there. I be, really believe that someone, you're going to get a call soon about trying to make a movie about this story because it, it has a lot of girth to it. Um, it has, of course, the historical uh, piece there. But this is a really compelling story that I think a lot of people would want to know about. So I'm glad that it's getting out there. It's getting more traction. I, I know your students must be excited. I mean, how do they feel having their teacher all over the news and in these events here? I mean, I, I'll be interested to hear how they're reacting to learning about this new fame and your, you know, learning about your grandfather's contribution to black history. How are they reacting to all this? Oh, they've been really excited about it because before I got into classroom on Monday, most of the students had saw it and they were so happy. And the ones who didn't see it, they're like, Dr. Bond, we want to see it. We didn't see it. And so I played in the class and I mean, literally the, they were clapping so loud. <laughs> it was like earthquake going in the classroom, but it showed that they care and appreciate the story that you know, was now being told. So it's just, it's really been an awesome thing. And uh, I said, the students and the teachers around me have also, you know, give me support about it. And that's what's very important. And I'm so appreciative of it. Right. And, uh, you know, I think I, I mentioned this to you before as well, but I really think your book, uh, Unsung But Forever Remembered, I think it should be considered as part of the curriculum and perhaps maybe require reading for Black History Month in the in the state of North Carolina, in North Carolina public schools. How do you feel about the prospect of that? And is that something that you have already considered pursuing? It actually definitely is. Um, yeah, matter of fact, to make the long story short, I'm a board of directors member for the North Carolina Council for Social Studies. I'm a board member, and um, actually I'm running in March for a position for one of the vice president positions. They have uh, two vice president positions and one is open. And so I'm actually running for that vice presidential position uh, on March 3rd of this year. So I'm hoping for the best. And, you know, being on the board and the council, you know, you do have a lot of influence and being, you know, if elected vice president, it gives me even more um, flexibility because I've been pursuing it already. Um, I've been telling other county leaders in North Carolina that it should be required reading. I said in the county where my grandfather was born in Bertie County, it definitely should be um, required reading. So thankfully I have a cousin who is a superintendent of that county, Bertie County Schools, and he's helped me to see can, can they make that happen and see could they have at least a book for most of the students in that county about my grandfather. So we're actually going to work for that, and I hope it does because, like I said, the county that he lived in, I feel especially there, they should have yes. a copy. Yes, it should be statewide, but especially that county because that's where he was from because it happened right in the, right behind their doorstep, right. and most of the students didn't know about it. So it definitely should be incorporated in the curriculum. I absolutely agree. And I'm so glad to hear that you're going to be running for vice president uh, of that board. I wish you much success in that. Uh, but I had a, a follow on question to that. So in introducing new materials into the school curriculum, what's that process look like and what other entities have purview over what's included in school curriculums? Well, the good thing is in North Carolina trying to be more inclusive with adding more things in curriculum, especially black history, African-American history, because for me, I teach African-American history all year long because to me, African-American history is history. Uh, I also incorporate a lot of women's history. And one of the great things was just this last week, I had my students with research report. Most of them chose females. Uh, they chose Katherine Johnson, you know, from Hidden Figures. You know, they chose women like Charlie Chisholm, you know, Mae Jemison, the first African-American, you no know, astronaut. So that made me feel real good as well, that they decided to use females. Uh, one student chose Claudette Colvin, another song woman in black history, because, you know, everyone knows about Rosa Parks. But most of the time, most people don't know about Claudette Colvin. 
that she did with Rosa Parks did nine months before and never got, you know, any recognition for it. And Claudia Cope is actually still alive. And um, oh, wow. she actually was a fit. Yeah, and the, the great part of the story is that just recently, about a year ago, she was officially exonerated of all charges because they lied on her and said she assaulted police officers when she got off the bus. She was 15 years old. And so there's marks on her, her background for her whole life for 66 years. So last year, they finally dropped the charge and exonerated her, and she was excited by it. So I had students research a lot of the unsung people. So when you try to incorporate things curriculum, you know, the board do have to see it. The good thing, like I said, is now more than ever, they understand they need to be more inclusive. They get it now. Most people get it now. So some of the people that are kind of like don't want to you know, move, move too fast, they say, guess what? It's not about you. It needs to be done. So, I, so because of that, I think change will be coming faster when it comes to incorporating the African American struggle, but also the African American achievements and accomplishments, as well as women of all shades and what they wow. did. Because it's, it needs to be infused in the curriculum way more. Yeah, and that's a good uh, segue into Women's History Month, which is in March. Uh, it's almost like a uh, could be an extension of uh, Black History Month in a way, just a way to highlight uh, women who have charted their own course in, in history. Um, what, what special projects do you have your students working on for Women's History Month? Anything in particular? Oh, yes, I actually have a specific one I started about five years ago. Uh, I remember... Uh, a lady who works for the Wilson Times newspaper, and she loves history. Um, she would uh, work for Wilson Times. Many times she took pictures in my classroom when I dressed up as a Roman Caesar or an Egyptian pharaoh. And so she asked me one day, she was like, what can we do to incorporate more women's history? So what I started mm -hmm. doing in March, I have an essay contest for Henrietta Lacks, another woman who is unsung in the history books with the you know, the, her cells being used by our permission and, you know, that whole thing that went. So what I did start about five years ago, there's an essay contest. And, you know, I would say the top three essays, you know, I got a little prize money and I got a little grant money. So the first year I did it, I think the top winner got 20 bucks. And the runner-up, second place, 15, the other got 10. And so my principal at the time was like, you know what, Doc, I'll go... I'll go half. So if the winner got 20, I'll give 20 as well. And so I I'll take a picture of the three students who won. And so I've been doing that for the last five years. And what it really has done is really bring into spotlight more about women's history. So afterwards, not to then not only learn about Henrietta Lacks, but they also were motivated to learn more. Like they want to learn about the Katherine Johnsons or the Shirley Chisholm's or the Mae Jemison's or the, um, like Lucretia Mott or, you know, Susan B. Anthony, not just black yes. women, but just women in general, because, right. you know, even the white women, Spanish women, pretty much forgotten about in the history books. And so it mm -hmm. shed a light. So it really shed a light to the fact that women's history needs to be incorporated more. And so that um, assignment really gets the students motivated, especially when the money's added on as well with the prize. <laughs> yes. You know, I, I wish that I had a an engaging uh, teacher uh, for history, you know, like you are when I was growing up. I, I was just so disconnected from history because it, it the, the teachers were boring. There, there was very, you know, low energy, no engagement. Um, and it was, it was just boring. And it just, it, in turn, it made it very difficult for me to, latch on and, and be excited about it and learn the dates. It just became one of those courses like, ugh. So I, I, I really appreciate the approach that you take to uh, teaching and getting your students engaged and getting them excited about, I love how they're excited about Women's History Month. I mean, it's just awesome. But I want to circle back to your, your bid for vice president of the board because that's interesting to me and, and anyone who knows me knows I love politics. Is that election going to be decided by the citizens, or will you be elected among your peers? No, that's a good question. It's actually elected through the peers for, for those who are on the social board. So what they do, they have a convention 
uh, the first week of March. And um, okay. they invite all the social studies teachers who wants to come, they have to be a member. They invite them to um, the convention. And it's a two-day convention, and they have different workshops, professional developments, and guest speakers. And I'll be teaching uh, professional development like I did last year. Uh, last mm-hmm. year, I taught a uh, professional development, which was very hands-on and made history relevant and interesting. And it was called Using Social Emotional Skills and Lessons for Students to Make you know, social studies teaching, engaging and fun. And uh, I used the Roberta Flack song, you know, uh, no, excuse me, the Johnny Gill and a Stacey Lass song, a perfect combination. So before the workshop oh, yes. started, I started playing it. And so the older <laughs> folks in the crowd, oh, I remember that song, a perfect combination. And what I told the teachers, just like I try to make that professional development interesting for them, we have to do that for the students because I said social studies can be the most interesting, coolest subject to teach. But if you teach it wrong, it's the worst and most boring subject you yeah. have. And so yeah. I said, you don't want to be, yeah, and you don't want to be that teacher that they say, wow, that class is boring, it's lame. You want those kids that I looked at, I like, we're going to learn something fun, we're going to learn something cool. And even when we learn those history facts, which are not the fun facts, you still got mm-hmm. engaged. And there was a moment like that just uh, this Friday where, and I do want to mention this, because uh, a student had uh, was doing a report on Harriet Tubman. And when she's doing the research, you know, the research said they don't know when her birthday was. And the girl didn't understand why they didn't. And I said back then, slave was, slaves were like cattle, chattel. Yes, you know, yes. they didn't keep our birthdays. In other words, we were not considered humans or relevant. So that's why like the Frederick Douglass or... Harry Tubman or, you know, these, you know, the, four, the slaves, Nat Turner, they know their birthdays because no one cared. You know, they pretty much most of the time were just bred like animals when they were conceived anyway. And so it was a hard truth to tell this young lady. But at the same time, she needed to hear the truth. So even when history becomes that tough truth, the students would rather hear the tough truth than you just sugarcoat and lie about it. It's true. It's best to be as forthcoming as you can with students because they're not dumb. You know, it's just best to keep it real with them. Obviously, there are, there are instances where you you need to protect them uh, in, in certain you know for certain things, but just keeping it real and like you said, look, you know, no one cared about you know our birthdays back then. We weren't looked on or looked upon as human. So those are just some harsh truths that. Especially the younger generation, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm glad that um, we're we're still teaching Black history and history period to these children because there are a lot of uh, initiatives going around, as you know, that are looking to um, have revisionist history or just no history altogether. Um, so it, it's just it's good that this stuff is still being taught to our kids in a way that's engaging in a way that they um, are eager to learn. Um, I encourage every, everyone to uh, go to your Instagram because you, you have a couple of clips on there um, that illustrate how you engage with your students. And one of the ones that I like the most uh, is where you, you did the crate challenge, which it seems like so long ago, that crate challenge. But, uh, of course, you didn't follow through with it, but you had the kids so excited, like, no, Dr. Bond, don't do it. I just thought it was so <laughs> cool. That grabs their attention. And it also lets them know, hey, my teacher knows what's going up. He knows the latest trends. He knows what's cool. So um, I just love how you engage your students. So I, I definitely hope you keep that up. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And that's really like half the battle. I know it sounds so cliche to say, but half the battle is making it interesting, engaging, because like the fact I knew about the Create Challenge and um, you know, Slap the Teacher Challenge, and those things actually bother me. But I also figured let's make this, into like a comedy you know, or as a parody. And so I said, we really could do that. And so we made it to a parody and it worked out. And uh, no, it was a fun, but it also showed the students knowledge. Like that young man who said the preamble of the constitution, his mother watched that clip and she was almost in tears. She was like, wow, my son can recite the preamble of the constitution word, to, word for word. Oh, and man. so yeah. it's still, so it's still the learning piece that's still part of it, which I'm thankful for. So now we're just sitting around just, you know, trying to slap the teacher and having fun. They're still learning, being gained. Uh, they were reciting 
uh, facts from Supreme Court cases and different laws. And so that what makes it, you know, fun. But also, like I said, it's, it's learning as well. Well, hats off to you. I mean, uh, you know, you're you're a dynamic teacher, so I just really appreciate and respect the work that you do. Um, we have a few more minutes in this this first segment. I want to uh, have you to touch on. I believe you have a speaking engagement coming up tomorrow at Freeport Memorial Library. Now, I think this is the one uh, in your hometown, right? Yes, and I'm really excited about it because um, I'm sure my age is 31 years ago. I graduated from Freeport High School. <laughs> Uh, back in 1992, and so that is the home of where uh, you know, great entertainers like uh, Chuck D from Public Enemy used to reside yes. between yes. Freeport and Roseville, and also um, have out from the rap group Mob Deep. So uh, I'm proud of being from Freeport, and so coming back and to speak at the Memorial Library, I'm so excited, and I've been getting calls from people who I graduated with because our, our school had about 2,500 students. Our graduating class had about 550 people. It was huge. So I have a lot of people that's going to attend, and I'm just so excited by it because some of the people I've seen, like maybe a couple of years ago, kind of been back in New York in a couple of years, but some people I've not seen in maybe 20 years, I'm going to see them, and they're supporting the book and have brought the book and shared with family members and friends. So I'm just excited about uh, speaking there tomorrow night at 7 p.m. at Freeport Memorial Library. Oh, man, I'm excited for you. Be sure you take some good pictures and videos and and throw those on your Instagram. I think that'll um, really be exciting to see. So great, great luck to you tomorrow um, on your speaking engagement. Um, Before we wrap up, tell us a little bit about uh, what you have coming down the pipeline this year. Well, some of my goals for uh, this year is I'm hoping and praying that I do get that position for the vice president for yes. the uh, Social Studies Council, the state council. That would be a huge achievement, something that I'm pulling for. Because, like I said, with that position, I would even be able to have a lot more say, a lot more influence with what's being taught. And uh, the other vice president who's there now, you know, he's a great guy and we get along great. And so, you know, it would just be awesome where I can have a position where my impact be felt even more. And so also continue to keep, you know, talk about my grandfather's book. And my goal was either, you know, to do a doc, have a documentary slash movie done about it because it's something, you know, you mentioned it, but it's something I thought about and prayed about. I was like, I felt like, wow, this could be a great story because Mm -hmm. it's a, it's an inspirational story because even with the negativity where he was denied, he, as you know, he was a persistent man and persevering with a husband and father and a great job as a family man. And when he died, he still owned two homes. So, you know, he was wow. denied. He was a businessman. And that, to me, shows how much he persevered and the knowledge he had at the time in the Jim Crow era. He knew that property meant power. Property has power. That's definitely mm-hmm. a word for and a message for this show. Listen, Dr. Bond, it was a pleasure speaking with you again, brother. Thank you so much for your time once again and for giving us an update on your progress with your book. Thank you. I want to thank you for your support for this book because it means a lot to me, and I truly, truly appreciate it. And thank you again. Yes, sir. Pleasure is all mine, and you're more than welcome to return anytime. So Dr. Bond's latest book, Unsung But Forever Remembered, is available for purchase on Amazon.com. For more information, you can check our show's webpage at artistsfirst.com. And be sure to follow Dr. Bond on social media, especially on Instagram. It's at Dr. Stephen Bond on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we return, I'll be introducing another impressive black author with a compelling story. You definitely don't want to miss this. We'll be right back. Hey ladies, have you ever dated a married man? Have you ever thought to yourself, that would never be me? Have you ever wondered, how could she? 
Have you ever said, she should be ashamed of herself? Well, I used to say those same things. And I've pointed fingers that I don't point anymore. Because now, I am that other woman. What do you do when you meet a man that makes you question everything you thought was wrong? Where do you go when life has led you into a dark place where society frowns upon you and even your own mother is disappointed in you? Who do you turn to for guidance and support when there's no one you can share your secret with? Life is more complex than the list of rules you've been taught throughout the years. Situations are not always black and white. Sometimes your mind and your heart don't want the same thing, and you find yourself in a battle between right and wrong. I never understood how women got themselves in these situations until I was that woman. We don't always seek the circumstances we end up in. Although many people may not understand, there are some that do. If you ever find yourself dealing with a forbidden love, How to Date a Married Man, 10 Rules of Engagement, written by Dr. Andre Jerry, is a must-read. It's not comprised of judgments and lectures, but rather rules of engagement that you must apply when you find yourself the other woman in his life. Ready to learn more? The controversial new book, How to Date a Married Man, 10 Rules of Engagement, written by relationship expert Dr. Andre Jerry, is now available for sale exclusively on Amazon and Kindle. You're back live with Dr. Andre Jerry. Welcome back. So if you're just joining us, tonight we're celebrating Black History Month by featuring notable black authors who are leaving their mark in history. Now, if you know me at all, you know that authors hold a special place in my heart. And I'm always encouraging people within my sphere of influence to write their own book. Now, what I love about my next guest is that he was the main source of encouragement in writing my first book, Write or Die. So please help me welcome my second guest of the evening, Mr. Zane Edwards. Welcome to the show, brother. Oh, hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Well, listen, before we even get started, I just want to say this. Brother, thank you for always encouraging me and and pushing me to keep working on my book, my first book. You know, without you pushing me the way that you did, there's no telling when I would have finally released that book. But because you always would get on me about my writing and my progress, I was able to stay on course and stay focused and finally become a published author, which opened the door for many opportunities, my own live radio show being one of them. So, brother, again, thank you so much. Surely welcome. So enough about me. Tonight is all about you and your first book, Life's Lyrics. But before we get into the book, Zane, uh, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Jerry, for having me on the show and taking time to even have an opportunity to express my book. And I'm just uh, a family man, uh, born and raised in Georgia. I have four kids, uh, three boys and a girl. And my career has been in the field of tool and die. I was a tool and die maker for 35 plus years as a tradesman. And I'm retired now. And I to tell you, it's enjoyable in some aspects, but my hobbies in itself, while I've been retired, is drawing and writing, of course, my poetry, and I have other hobbies, but it's, it's been a blessed time. Absolutely. Well, I, I do know that you enjoy your retirement quite well. You've worked hard all of your life and have had a really notable career in, in tool and die artistry. Um, but I know, I know a lot of people, I know the answer to this, of course, but a lot of people would be interested to know how did you discover your gift for writing? Well, initially, it started out with me writing poems for family members, friends, and special occasions like birthdays, mother days, and reunions, and even uh, for lost loved ones. 
And the feedback I got from her was getting uh, some positive feedback, and it really inspired me to move forward. I remember that. You um, you were writing a, a few things, some poetry, and you were putting it on your Facebook page, and it got really rave reviews and a lot of positive feedback. And I, I think that was the origin of it, and it just kind of sprung from there. And you would write personalized poems for people and take them to work or then post them online, and people would just rave and rave about it. Yes, I did. As a matter of fact, that, that was an amazing time because initially – and, you know, I, I was inspired to write. The Lord blessed me with the talent in itself. And but what was amazing was that I even had people to tell me a case scenario of what they wanted a poem or a portrait to sound like uh, just by telling me things about themselves. And that challenge turned out to be easy for me because I had to find out within myself was it worthy because me, myself, as a skilled tradesman and being in aerospace and being a technical person, I've never been one of a writer, and the Lord blessed me with that. And uh, with all the challenges, I was able to produce the poems or poetry, and they they loved it. They did. I, I remember many stories that you told me about uh, people's responses to your poetry. Um, in your poetry, how would you describe your writing style, your specific writing style? Well, there's actually about 15 different types of poetry styles. My style is more of a lyrical and a narrative style. And that's what my book is about. That style you will see as for, for the most part what for me writing. Definitely. I, I, I've read many of your poems, and I told you this a long time ago. They seem to have uh, uh, this pattern, like almost like a, a, a rap. And so that's why I, I had encouraged you to... Uh, uh, name your book, you know, lyrics, because it, it, it doesn't come off like your standard or typical poetry. It, it's almost like a, a freestyle of sorts. So you definitely have a unique style. And, and, and what I like about that style also is that because of the way you write, um, it attracts a lot of young people. And then, you know, without them realizing it, you're infusing a lot of wisdom and insight uh, into your poetry. So they're, they're, they're getting that aspect of it as well. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yes, I would. One of the things that uh, I'm an advocate for is to give a thought process transitioning for the younger generation and by sharing in my poetry the things that I've encountered in my years of being here. But one of the things about the younger generation, their patience is not what uh, the old school, as they say, the OGs, as they say, over time. <laughs> they, they want to keep it 100, as they say. So you can't be sugarcoating it. you got to be straight and, and with them, and then they can respect that and appreciate it more. Absolutely. So we, we touched on, you, you know, you, the title of your book is called Life Lyrics. Um, I don't remember. Do you remember what the initial name of your book was before we uh, changed the title? I, I, I don't happen to remember. Do you? Yes, I do. Life Lyrics, I mean, uh, Life's Everyday Thoughts is what I originally uh, yes, wanted to name it. it. But uh, because of the nature of the problems uh, with the younger generations, it was more to, to me what uh, uh, and on the business side, which uh, folks would look at, is had a captured market. And it was a concern to me to look around and see how much violence, uh, black-on-black crime going on and people not understanding and even across the thing, the beauty of poetry is that it, it unifies people. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, or uh, Jews or Gentiles. It doesn't matter. You can cross that barrier by expressing through your words. That's right. I, when you said the title, I, I remember it was Life's Everyday Thoughts or something to that effect. And it, not that anything was wrong with that title, but it, it to me, it just it needed more something with a little bit more pizzazz. And when I read your 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 poetry, I was like, you know, this this is not your everyday poetry. This is almost like, you know, hip hop style writing. I was like, you may want to change the name of that. So that's how we ended up <laughs> uh, coming up with that title. But um, yeah, that's that's just interesting. I so okay. I want to ask you this: your plans to write future books? Where where are you with that? Because I know you've been getting asked from people you used to work with, family members, uh, people who have, you know, 
picked up your first book, they're all asking what your plans are for subsequent books. So tell us where you are with that. Well, actually, I'm glad you asked, asked that because uh, I just finished my next book entitled Reality of Truth. And I really, my style is one that is uh, to unify people and to help people. And uh, it's truly, when we as individuals experience something, you know, it's traumatic in a lot of time, anxiety, uh, stress, lack of money, uh, lack of love, lack of peace of mind, period. And so, you know, uh, in itself, it, it's time for it to come on out there. So it's something I'm looking forward to putting out there. Because reality of truth is what we all need right now in these trying times. Okay, well, I'm excited about that book. I, I know you shared just a few of the poems that, that will be included in that, but um, I can't wait to read the entire thing. Um, I know there are a lot of people out there listening that um, may be aspiring poets or writers, and they may be wanting to put a book out. They may be actually sitting on a masterpiece of their own. What's your advice to people out there who want to put out a book but may have some trepidation? Well, that's, that's also uh, something to think about. Well, first of all, recognize that they are worthy of writing. It does not matter who you are, what walks of life. There is an avenue for you at this, this day and time in order to do it. For instance, uh, using my uh, style or my poetry as an example, if you want to get into to writing, you need to be able to work on your being concise, your rhythm, and your storytelling skills. And then, you know, you can start. And for those that, for instance, one of the things I ran into, believe it or not, was uh, I was concerned because my strong suit is mathematics and being a technical person, but the English grammar and stuff like this here that people are worried about in their writing or writing of books, there's templates and stuff online that you can Google as yes. an example. And that you also can look at the fact that if you got spell check stuff you can do as far as your storyline, different programs that you can actually help you build it. And then you got outlets. When it's time to put it out there, just tell the story as you feel it. Don't be scared to write it down. The first thing is to get it from your mind to paper. Right. And you can fix all the other stuff later. Um, getting bogged down in spelling and punctuation, all that. Just get the idea down. Don't worry about how it looks. Don't worry about how it sounds. That can be changed later. Um, so, you, you know, thankfully, I'm pretty good in English, so I, I, I didn't have to stress out so much about that. But I want to encourage people out there who, you know, you may not be that good in, with writing or English, but you still have some things that you want to put out there uh, in the form of a book. Like uh, Zane said, there. YT University, as, as my friend Craig would say, YouTube University. You can find courses and uh, titles of anything on YouTube that will help you uh, where you fall short or if you want to educate yourself on something. So there's really no excuse there. And then even if you got a little bit of change, you want to hire a, a consultant. There are people out there that will take your um, rough draft and they'll put their panache on it and make it presentable, make it marketable. Um, even go the extra step to get it on to the Amazon and KDP. So there are resources out there. So I definitely want to encourage someone who may have a story to tell that's been procrastinating because they're, oh, I'm not a writer. You don't have to be a writer. Just get it out there uh, and get it on paper. And you really can kind of edit from there and, and, and get it to where you need to get it before it's released. So since we mentioned that, I want to go with any final thoughts that you may have or any quotes or maybe perhaps even some poetry that you want to share with the audience? Well, actually, yes, I, I can. Uh, I, on my Instagram, I often write and I post it on Instagram. And uh, because, of, like I said once before, the younger generation, uh, they want to keep it 100, but yet and still they don't have the patience for the longer version. <laughs> but the book itself, you know, it, get, it gives all kinds of verses that you can linger on. And as my son told me, Dad, you can write something and five, uh, five people can read it and five people get five different uh, messages from it. And that's, that's right. the beauty of it. 
my wife even uh, told me one day I had you truly have a gift because I've been sitting there trying to write like you for three hours. And that's always something I draw from. But as far as the little jewels, as one wise man once called them, you know, I, I'll just read a, a few of them right here that you would probably appreciate. Go to right ahead, bro. Work, to yourself, be true. Then your path in life becomes clear to you. All this is on my Instagram for those that are... Uh, that's one of your favorite so quotes, work. actually. Yes, it is. I and mean, that's what I'm giving. A lot of people that know me are going to get tired of these. But these are <laughs> something that people can grasp and relate to. A lot of okay, people run another around... One? Another one is people run around saying, what is love? A lot of people really don't know what love is. There's uh, no boundary in it because you got people 60, 70, 80 years old still don't know what love is. But now, uh, check this out. For those that think they know what love is, it's pure love is unconditional with compassion of no end. That is something that was an epiphany for me as well. Now, in that, I would say this. People know that we're, we have a lot of challenges nowadays. There's a lot of changes that's required nowadays. Another one is change comes when acceptance is clear of fear. And one of my other favorites is the one that uh, often I think is a mind uh Teacher, thoughts followed by action merges the spiritual to the physical. For example, if I if you got a picture on a, a base that's expensive, it's a party going on, everybody's uh, enjoying themselves. That base costs three hundred thousand dollars. You looking at that base, it's going to be knocked over and broken. I can't replace that base. The thought you walk over, you move it uh, back. Followed by the action, merges the spiritual to the physical. I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm on your Instagram now, and I see one that we talked about this one before. I, I, I want to read this one because it it's just good. And it, it is a, a bit of a riddle, but if you have a, a spiritual mindset, you know what this is saying. It says, riddle me this. I am a has-been. He is a have-been. And still is. And now that's short, but it's profound because you're talking, of course, about Jesus Christ. And I like the aspect of not belittling yourself, but just acknowledging that without Jesus, we are nothing. We can't do anything apart from him. So that's one that I really I think you wrote that one uh a couple of weeks ago or something, right? Yeah, it was a short time ago. But that is truly what it is. See, oftentimes we get beside ourselves and think that we know everything, but yet we really know nothing. Yes. Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in all the world. If you don't have the goodness in you, if you don't follow that good heart, you, 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 you lose everything. And so I'm a has-been simply because as I grow, we can be 80, 90 years old. But I'm a has-been. My body's got to return to the soil. But yet Jesus is still is. He's always there. He's the one answering the prayer. He's the one that's looking out for us. And he's there when nobody else is. Absolutely. Absolutely, brother. I, I, I'm, like I said, I'm just scrolling. I, I found another one that I haven't read before, but I, I, this one just caught my eye. It's called um, Hold On. And it says, you are not alone. Hope isn't gone. Charity starts at home. Your anxiety is now full blown. You must maintain focus and stay in the zone. Cling to the righteousness you have been shown. The light will guide you home. You've got to do a book of just micro poetry and quotes. Stuff like this <laughs> almost is like a, uh, what do you call those books that you flip through every day? Like a, almost like a devotional. People have yeah. them on their desk and things like that. This, this, you have a lot of great quotes here that are technically micro poems, but this is stuff that could really jolt someone and just really put them on uh, the right mental playing field for the day. Yes. And uh, speaking of that, what people got to look at, too, uh, life, uh, my, my book itself is the meat of the subject, but yet and still, you've got to be able to have something that you can quote that's inspirational in the subject. And that's what every verse, I linger on every verse that I write at any time. I don't care if it's two or three lines, two or three words. I, there's a purpose and a pattern of 
sharing with somebody. Absolutely. Now, how have your children uh, and your family responded to your poetry? Your children in particular. I know they must be proud. Well, uh, they have been positive, and you know, a man's legacy is nothing more than his family and love. Because we spend a whole lot of time in my younger days. I was out there like the young younger generation now, chasing money or for the young fellows. You're chasing girls and a good time and all that, but. That's really a waste of time, and they don't understand that. My family has been very supportive of me, my kids especially, and uh, I truly love them for their comments, and they they appreciate it, and they they thank me, and they they encourage me to keep writing. They encourage me every day to keep writing. Well, I'm going to encourage you to keep writing too. I mean, you really are a dynamic writer. Um, I know that your writing gift was uh, a bit delayed. It came kind of later in your life. But that doesn't, you know, take away from the power in, in your words. So I definitely look forward to your next book and books and uh, keep posting on your Instagram these quotes. A lot of them are powerful. I think I even re-posted uh, some of these. But uh, as we close out this segment, do you have any uh, final thoughts uh, for our listeners tonight? I just want to say that poetry has been and great outlet for me and to express my thoughts and my feelings in life in general and all the ups and downs that comes with it. In writing poetry, I hope it can help others and see how we are alike than we are different. More so, I just, I just want people to know that you gotta have unity. We spend too much time hating each other or finding excuses not to be a part of each other's lives. You got to charity to start at home simply because you got to forgive somebody if you have animosity. You got to show love. Yes. You got you yeah. got to be willing to change. And everything starts and stops with you. If you if you don't correct the person that you are first, nothing else can be corrected. Amen. Well, listen, Mr. Edwards. Thank you so much for your time this evening. This was a great interview, and I'm certain our listeners enjoyed. Uh, this particular segment, you are more than welcome to return anytime that you uh, want to promote your next book or any upcoming projects that you may have. Um, so to the listeners, again, Zane Edwards' book is entitled Life Lyrics, Life Lessons to Help Young Men Transition into Manhood. And it's available for purchase on Amazon. So be sure to follow him on social media. Links to his book and social media will be listed on our show's homepage at artistsfirst.com. So that's our show for tonight, folks. Be sure to join me next Wednesday on March 22nd at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on the Artist First Radio Network. Good night, everybody.